This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. Today, Professor Doug James will tell us about how his lab is generating hyper-realistic but fake synthetic sounds. They use the principles of physics to try to match those amazing computer-generated graphics with equally amazing sound. It's the future of CGS, computer-generated sound. We have all heard the term CGI, computer-generated images or graphics, and we see them in movies, television shows, and increasingly in games and virtual reality. But along with those images, we want to have sound, and in some cases, our ears are exquisitely tuned to whether the sound that we're hearing matches the images that we're seeing. Anyone who's ever seen a television show or a movie that's out of sync knows how distracting that is. We know what things are supposed to sound like. We know what water sounds like. We know what fire sounds like. We know what two objects crashing into each other sound like. So this needs to be part of our experience watching movies, playing games, and in virtual reality. And yet we're not quite there yet. My guest today is Professor Doug James, a professor of computer science and music at Stanford University, and is studying how to use the principles of physics to generate sound. Sound comes from vibrations and from accelerations, and you need to understand the physics of those processes in order to figure out how to generate the sounds that should go along with our amazing computer-generated graphics. This is the future of computer-generated sound. Doug. You're working on generating uh, synthetic but realistic sounds. Why? What drew you to this problem? I mean, one one goal we've always had is trying to reproduce the world in virtual environments. So being able to simulate pictures or simulate motion of objects and animate things has always been really exciting. So for me, I got excited about simulating the motion of physical objects, so objects bouncing and deforming and water splashing and things like that. But the one thing that always struck me was that we we're basically making silent movies inside the computer, right? And so sound was added as an afterthought, like it was, you know, at the turn of the century uh, some time ago. Um, but now in the computer now, we can actually simulate this process as well. So being able to make pictures with sound seemed like a natural thing to do. Yeah, so that does make sense. And, and what's hard about it? So for someone who hasn't thought about this, I guess I had never thought about it before talking with you. And I said, I guess they just like make recordings out in the wild and kind of dub them in. But I don't even actually know if that's true. So what are the challenges and opportunities here? Yeah, so you can record sounds and add them in. And, you know, for, for a lot of things, that's probably the right thing to do. It's simple and you get things done. But if you want to actually be able to simulate a, a virtual phenomenon, like, say, a slinky falling down the stairs and have sound added that matches exactly when collision events happen, then you need this this extra level of, of synchronization, which is hard to fake. So the more stuff happening that you want to synchronize, then it's it's harder to get it exactly right. And um, so being able to have a, an, an algorithm in the computer that can actually just compute all those collision events with sound and play it back makes it, it's, it's in some ways the easiest way to do it. Yes, okay, so that, that really does make sense. And, and I think everybody is aware of the remarkable advances in CGI that we've seen and that we're now seeing in movies routinely. And I don't think many of us have thought about where does that sound come from? And I guess what the first, piece of news is they are not simultaneously routinely generating both the images that we're seeing and the sound. Are those currently separate activities? It depends on, on who you talk to. So like in movies, um, the frames are generated and then in post-production, people make up sounds in any way they want and, and add them in. And that's a, a very manual uh, process. In, in interactive applications, like in games or training simulators and things like that, you actually have to generate a events and then from say some simulator or something and then sound is added so those could be like pre-recorded clips that get added in when some very laborious process in the future and, and increasingly you're going to be able to compute actual physical models of the sound and to be able to just automatically put, put them in together so in some sense the best motivation for realistic uh, computer generated sound is laziness right we just don't want to have to do all this stuff i don't want to have to click through 40,000 tab panes and say play this sound when this a object hits object k you know you just automatically do it because there's a method that gets called and the usual explanation that computers are so slow and nobody 
nobody would ever want to do this. It just doesn't make any sense anymore because we have code to do it and we have super fast parallel computers. So we just compute reality in the computer and has sound right. too, thankfully. And, no, that, and that really does make sense because then, as you said, it moves from being a post-production thing to something that's done during the production. And of course you can edit it, fix it up, but it's a huge difference in the workflow of the people making either the game or the movie or the TV show or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so a key feature of your approach to this, and like there's so many questions because I want to talk about like what sounds are hard and we'll get we'll get to that but you you've really been um pioneering i believe what what, what we call physics based generation of sound right. and so what would the other choices be so i guess my question is what does physics based mean and what would be something that's non physics based yeah so i mean non physics based things are well like it, unlike computer graphics where we we came up with models to render spheres and draw pictures of them and so on and then eventually later data driven capture image based rendering and and video based things caught on um in in sound the data driven approaches automatically were the first thing everybody went to they used recordings of reality you know maybe you modify this recording to you know uh, of a bear and play it backwards and make it sound you know larger than life and use that whenever something happens um so the data-driven approaches for sound were, were the automatic first things to do you get a lot of data recordings and then you figure out when to play them either you do it by hand as a, like a talented sound designer would do in movie post-production or you come up with all these pre-recorded events and hook them up to events uh, in your game or something. So those are those will give you high quality sounds. I mean, realism is not necessarily a goal there. Like if I, I shoot a, a laser blaster, I don't know what that doesn't even exist. You know, right. like it's, it's not realism <laughs> isn't really a thing, right? So this should be plausible, but it should be larger than life in a lot of scenarios. So the kind of thing we're doing for physics based sound, um, we're trying to come up with models of vibration of like a structure or like a like a, a teapot or something. And then you use those vibration models to drive vibration models of the of the air pressure waves to come up with the sound. And so the idea of a lot of physics based approaches is that if you add enough physics, then it'll put it together. It'll sound plausible. It'll sound, you know, have gotcha. some amount of realism. Of course, realistic uh, sound production of things that don't exist doesn't really make sense. But the idea is that if you have enough physics and, and realistic physical models, um, then you can get things that make people think, oh, wow, that that kind of sounds like real. I remember one time uh, we were uh, I was giving a talk and I, I did a sound check and I took a bunch of plates and this video and smash them on the ground and this poor poor uh, lady at the back of the uh, room who was setting up all the glassware and stacks sort of freaked out because it just like oh, i'm like, sorry sorry yes but it wasn't it sounded like she had yeah. not done her job well it had you know that had, that event had never happened those plates never existed but there was enough uh, plausibility there that it tricked the brain into thinking something actually did happen Okay, so great. So the, the physics based approach is literally based on a model of how real sounds arise, you know, there are structures that have molecular, they have molecular structures, they break, they crack, they hit each other, uh, there are uh, vibrations that and, and uh, that form and, and so we're really trying to model it at that level, which uh, sounds complicated. So is this a big computing challenge? It's, it's, it definitely pushes things to the limit. So if you think about what we have to do to make pictures, you know, in a movie, you might have uh, a simulation of, you know, objects bouncing around, some plates bouncing on the floor. This happens at, you know, 24 frames per second in film and then maybe 60 frames or, or more in an in a, in a interactive game these days. But mm -hmm. For sound, you have to compute everything between the frames. You hear all these oscillations at uh, audio rates, so like 20 kilohertz, you know? Um, so that's right. like, if you're doing something at 24 frames and you wanna compute at 24K, now you have a thousand times more samples to generate. And the other problem is that, you know, basically you could say, oh, but how hard is it to compute sounds? Like two pixels, right? I gotta compute a two pixel image, you know, but it's at a really high frame rate, right? So, and right. the other thing is that you hear everything comes to you. So every part in the scene that vibrates and generates sound in 3D space gets evol evaluated at, at these really high temporal rates. So you have the space and time complexity of everything coming to your ears, right? So yes. um, you end up having to do everything for these things. So it's kind of a dense sampling problem at really high rates. And the scenes can be really complicated. You know, you could say I have like a ball bouncing on the ground. How hard is that? Or maybe I have some some one object, a Stradivarius guitar, you know, big deal, uh, a violin, sorry. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, 
And so, but the details of that structure and how it vibrates and how how the bow, you know, slip sticks right. along on right. the string, you know, those details are all displayed and you can hear them, right? So, so the thing that we're really excited about is um, not so much how like sound waves pass through the air, which is the wave equation, which is well understood, but the sound sources themselves. What happens when when things hit, uh, what happens when things vibrate, what happens when water splashes into a cup, you know, how do those disturbances in the air get created by these sound sources? So almost everything we do in, in physics based animation needs to be able to make sound. And so that process of turning an animation into a sound source and getting it in, into the environment, um, that's the kind of thing that we focus on. So and and I and I mentioned it briefly, but I want to return to it to see if, if this really matters. So I think about all the different balls I could drop on the ground, and there's like a baseball made out of you know whatever yarn plus leather, football, uh, basketball. Then there's rubber balls and there's golf balls. They're all gonna the, their molecular structure literally is what determines. So do you have to get down to a model of oh like what does rubber look like? Like what are the what do the bonds look like in the in the molecules? Or or can you avoid getting down to molecular level description? and still do okay. Yeah, so our a lot of the physics that we do is classical mechanics and we have just bulk deformations of structures, right? So we don't need to know the detailed uh, molecular structure. You may want to know the, the the mass density and the stiffness of the structure. It's like an elastic object or something. Uh, maybe things when they s hit and stick or slide with some frictional roughness. Those kind of things are, you know, bulk properties we need to know. But we don't know. We don't need to know the details. A lot. A lot of these other things. Um, um, so, f so there are different things that. So, if you think of an object, it, the, the kind of things that we care about are exactly how does the object vibrate, if it vibrates, and um, so for larger structures they vibrate. Um, for tiny things, uh, like a, for example, if you take like a marble and drop it on the ground and it makes a, a sound. If you just like model the vibrations of that structure. You'll get some frequencies, and then if you play back the sound generated by those this vibrating, you know, a ball bearing hitting the ground, you basically get no sound. You'll like you hear like a and a little tick, and then that'll be it. It'll be like, what happened to the sound? Right. And so some structures are big, vibrate, and you hear those vibrations produce sound. But other things, when they're really tiny, the vibrations will be too high. So like if you have a tiny marble or ball bearing, it will hit wow. the ground and maybe vibrate at 50 kilohertz is the lowest frequency. And you can't hear anything above 20K, or I can't hear anything. If I keep playing right. these guitars, I won't hear anything above like 8K. Right, so, right. right. Pete Townsend, yeah. yeah exactly. So. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the tiny structures, they accelerate the surface mostly due to the rigid acceleration. When they hit the ground, like tens of microseconds, they collide and then bounce back. And you hear this little click. So you can hear the difference between like a, a, a glass marble clicking and a ball bearing clicking or a click of a, of a dime versus the click of a penny. And there's some some vibrations of those structures, like a like a plate, which are low enough. You can hear a little ring, but mostly tiny, tiny things have this acceleration noise where they have these clicks. Yes. So if you smash a pane of glass and all these little bits and they fall on the ground, you hear these clicks. And those are acceleration right. impulses that you're hearing in the air versus larger structures like uh, you know, a tuning fork. When you hit it, it vibrates and you get the acceleration due to the vibration. So in practice, we have sound sources that have acceleration noise and vibration ringing noise. Okay. And those are the so things that we try to figure give, out. Give yeah, so give me just one more sentence on this acceleration sound because I don't think of acceleration as something that I hear. So um, just go through that one more time to make sure. Uh, is it that so the, the marble is hitting the ground and when should I think of the acceleration as being happening and generating whatever the sound is? Yeah, so the, you think of a sound waves coming due to acceleration of boundaries that interact with it. And so the okay. acceleration can be due to the, the, the rigid motion of the object going down, hitting the ground and accelerating back upwards in a very okay. short period of time. It happens so quick, but you know, you can, it actually is audible and that's the click gotcha. sound. And then the other accelerations you hear are like the actual elastic vibrations of structures. And those can okay. happen at much lower rates and, uh, you know, are like a string of a guitar causes a vibration at a little. Gotcha. Yeah.
So now you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned a pane of glass breaking, and I know you've written a lot about fracturing, and there's a sound, obviously, of things being blown to smithereens, and of course we all know that both games and TV shows and movies, are f people love things being blown to smithereens. Right. What are the special challenges of, um, especially when you have to coordinate with a, a, a graphical model that was perhaps not even, you know, was generated by a computer, you have to figure out how to apply sound to that um, exploding object how how do you, how do you think about that the thing that immediately comes to mind is like how how do we make this fast because these things are really expensive you have all these vibrations the structures vibrating like tens of thousands of times every second so it's it's really expensive so any model that we use to compute this in the computer we want to reuse we want to build something and then allocate data structures and then compute it now whenever you do fracture or destruction whatever model you make you immediately destroy so this is like oh my gosh so we have like all kinds of model churn in the computer right so i built this model for this object and we broke it into 24 pieces now i have to make 24 new models and then we broke right. some of those and so all of a sudden right. the rate at which you're generating models uh any work you put into that can't be amortized because it's you're just destroying it again right so that's that's right. an interesting challenge of of those objects and um other it also is not other objects that change shape a lot also are, are hard. So if you have like a rigid object, its geometry is fixed, you can assume, make assumptions about how it vibrates and how it radiates. That's a, a lovely model. If it breaks and fractures, that's complication. Other objects have larger deformations, like a slinky is, is a challenging object because, yeah. you know, not only d does it change shape a lot, so you can't assume it's the same shape, but it also collides with itself. Often we assume, oh, objects don't self collide much, but a slinky is kind of like, like the you know devil's advocates the object that collides with itself the most like literally yes and and, and that sound is so no one will forget hearing their first slinky it's a very characteristic sound yeah exactly it has this sort of ring structure that has a nice sort of vibrational resonance and it has tons and tons like you throw it down the stairs and you'll have like literally millions of collision events with itself and these are all produce these acceleration noise effects as well as a classic ringing of the rings of the of the right. great um so uh, one one question i wanted to ask is i know in lighting people especially artificial lighting people are worried about you don't want to just get the light but then the light bounces off surfaces and creates other lighting that is like shadows and you know light is complicated and it bounces Sound is the same. So do you have to worry about the physical setting of where this, you're generating this sound and like the echo effects and the bouncing off other objects? It seems it would just add a whole nother level of complexity to the sound creation. Yeah, it's in some ways worse for sound because um, um, so you, you do have uh, shadows of sound and inner reflections of sound, just like we have with light. And, uh, and also sound can pass through structures just like light can pass through structures in fact we have structure borne sound and airborne sound and uh, but it's worse because we have diffraction so usually um usually for lighting unless you're doing very special glints and very small structures you don't have to worry about diffraction effects so much although it, it does help with hair and things like that um, um, the problem is that for sound, the wavelengths vary massively. So usually for light, you just assume they're basically infinitesimal, you use ray-based approaches, but for sound, sound disperses and, and uh, it diffracts around structures. And so instead of having like red, green, and blue, we basically have like all these different frequencies. It's like a many right. color problem in, in some sense. Right. And, uh, and so you have to include diffraction, otherwise you completely miss the amplitudes at which the sound gets radiated or diffracts around things. Low frequencies bend around things, well, high frequencies don't. So you get this interesting right. shadowing and, and, and reflection uh, effects due to frequency-based uh, diffraction. So that's a fun part. This is the future of everything. We'll have more with Professor Doug James next. Welcome back to the future of everything. This is Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Professor Doug James from Stanford University. In the last segment, Doug told us why generating hyper-realistic sounds is important, why it's hard, and why his lab is using physics-based methods to generate that sound. In this segment, he's going to tell us about the special challenges of simulating the sound of water 
and also the sound of fire. And he'll tell us about his most exciting frontiers of research in this area. It has to do with building tools so that we can more quickly generate realistic sounds, not only for movies and TV shows, but also in virtual reality where we'll be the ones doing the interacting and the system has to generate the sounds that result from the decisions we make in milliseconds. Doug, just going back to the last conversation, you talked about these amazing diffraction properties of, of sound and how it differs from light. For those who don't think about diffraction all the time, can you give a, an intuitive feel for what diffraction is for sound in particular? Yeah, it just means that sound waves can bend around things. So if you have a, a, a flashlight and you aim it at a wall and you go behind the wall, then you don't see the light anymore, right? Whereas if you if you play a sound uh, on the other side of the wall, you can still hear it on the other side. It, often it may pass through the, the wall, but it also can right. bend around it, right? So if, you, if, you're ta if I'm talking to you and I just go behind the doorway, I can still hear you around the doorway, even though there's gotcha. no direct pathway there. So it will gotcha. bend around things, yeah. So that follow, and that actually follows the intuition and life experience of everybody who's heard things. And so that's just that, that's the technical phrase for that phenomenon. Fair enough, good. So I wanted to get to some of these really challenging sound situations. And I know you've done a ton of work on water. Mm -hmm. So what's special about water sounds and, uh, and where are the frontiers of water synthesis? Yeah, so water is really, really a, 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 just a fascinating uh, sound source. So you can think of water as like a shape-changing loudspeaker, and uh, it vibrates at different frequencies. The frequencies that water vibrates are due to the bubbles inside it. So basically, each bubble has like compressed air, compressed by surface tension of this little bubble uh, and membrane, and it basically just pulsates like really fast. As they have really high frequencies, and uh, anytime a bubble gets pinched off, it starts vibrating like mad and that causes the fluid around it to vibrate that causes the surface of the water to vibrate and so it just vibrates at that frequency so you you know take a tinkle in the toilet or pour some water in a cup or whatever and you get all of a sudden these vibrations of the water just casting sound waves out so it, it and as it moves and changes shape it changes the the, the behavior of the of the sound and, and even the frequency as the bubble comes close to the right. surface it goes boop and it gets really high pitched and and you get right. a lot of bubbles when you have a wave crash and it just makes a ton of noise so, and, and this is clearly, and, and so to speak, there's a huge market for these sounds because they're so integral to any kind of human story, any kind of human experience. So I'm, I'm guessing that people really need this. And, and then when you're doing a simulation, so I know that people are working very hard at getting realistic graphical depictions of, of the water as well. Do you imagine that the sound will be co-generated with the images or are those still separate? Or So are, are we looking at a future maybe where as the sound as, as the water is simulated in graphics you're at the same time figuring out what the sounds are going to be for that water yeah it's inevitable that we'll be able to do this we'll be able to figure out how to do it and then we'll have codes that can do it efficiently and it'll just you just hit a button and it'll happen right so we're just at this point place where it's nascent right now there's some things where you just don't need to do that like it's off screen you know you're at the you're right you know you, i can't see it so who cares you just play anything you want um <laughs> if it's big enough to the 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 it's you know have huge events like a giant lots of waves coming in it's just a a, a roar so the question is is there is there uh, synchronization or not? Like, if do I need to see these things synchronized? Right. So the kind of things you want to compute sound for are these kind of small to mesoscale events where you're you know, pouring water in a cup or something falls on the ground and splashes or there's some other event where you're moving, your character's moving in the water and you want it to be synchronized. Yep. And you can automate it because it's a digital phenomena. And in those cases, then you can compute things and then have them synchronized and, and try to make them as plausible as possible. Well, yeah. Great. Yeah, that's really helpful that uh, you don't need it for the roar. You may not re need it for the single tiny little sound, but then there's this in the middle, you have to get it right because so much of our lived experience is with water at that scale. And so we're probably sensitive to mistakes in those. If those sounds don't sound right, we will all notice that right away. Right. Yeah. If you just play like the wrong clip that, you know, if you have somebody doing something interactively too, you don't know ahead of time what sounds you should look up in your database, right? Because, right. you know, even if you have the sound of every possible sound that could ever be created, uh, you know, infinite sounds, how do you know which one to play? You know, it's just, it's just play. not right. It's not an easy problem. So what about fire? We, we, we did water. 
When you think water, you think fire. It, fire seems to me that it would be hard, but is that actually the case? Fire's weird because it's not, um, it's not like a surface that's vibrating. It's not like an object that accelerates. It's a, it's a compression effect where you actually have a disturbance. And there's many different aspects of fire, like the aerodynamic effects of vortices that cause noise. But by far the most important sound contribution for a lot of you know fire effects that you have, I would, I would say, say around home, um, Maybe not around home, but you know, not like a jet engine or something. But um, is just the expansion of gas. So when you have combustion, you know, fuel flows into a flame front and then it expands. And the rate at which fuel is flowing in causes expansion. That uh, produces this sort of sort of divergent source that sort of makes things come out, and that causes pressure waves. And so it's basically, if you think of a candle, if I have a candle here and it's a steady flame, it's quiet, right? It doesn't make any sense, right. like just steady flame. But when I blow on it, it kind of disturbs. And the rate yes. of change of this heat release rate is the thing that causes the noise. And so ba yes. basically, the rate, of, the rate of change of this, uh, the rate at which things are burning, causes uh, a, you know, noise. And then that spreads out in the, in the world. So so for animations, we can come up with a model of the fire and then figure out the rate of change of this, of this burning. And then that gives us a way to get a lot of sound sources for the, for the flame. Now, if you have a, a fireplace, we all know about these pops. What, what's the genesis of these pops that we're hearing? Yeah, so if you, if you have like wet wood or you have like a liquid or something, then it's gonna off gas and then these build up pressure and then they pop out. And so there's a whole other aspect of what kind of fuels, if you have wet fuel, if you have liquid that's burning, or if you have, like, wow. you know, wow. uh, wood and that, that, those are really complicated. Uh, you know, you can, you can f fake those to some extent. If you can't see where it happened, you know, do you really need to compute it? It's synchronized. Yeah, right. Just throw it in there. And as long as it's, it's plausible. Um, great. Well, in the last minute or so, I wanted to ask you, what are the frontiers that you and your lab are most excited about? Where, where are the challenges where, I don't know, it's a blank page and, and you really don't know how to go after it, or maybe there's initial signs of progress, but there's a lot of work to do. What are the frontiers? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, challenges. One is just to make things uh, come up with a lot of models that allow you to model what you what you want for specific applications. If you're doing predictive modeling for sound, you really want it to match. If you're doing rainfall estimates from water sounds, then that's an important ocean act graphic problem. For virtual environments, you have the problem of, I have all these sort of objects on my desktop or something. How do I make sound sources for each of them? So you want to be able to auth people to author these sound models easily and then be able to put them together in, in an environment. Coming up with an integrated uh, sound rendering engine. So just like uh, you can you know, expect to be able to take lots of objects and render them in a picture, you know, all these from materials, metal, plastic, whatever, hair. Um, you want to be able to um, integrate all these and sound sources in an environment so that people like who are you know, making a, a rendering of an animation can add sound to them and have them all work together. So that when I pour you know, water in a, a metal can, I hear the water in the metal can interacting and things like that. So that's yes. a really tricky multi-physics coupling problem. Um, another thing is like parallelism. We have amazing fast, you know, GPUs these days. How can we exploit these, you know, teraflops of compute to just like actually make sound? We have enough compute to actually generate the sound, but we don't have we don't have systems that are optimized to to actually make it easy for people to to compute these things. So a lot of a lot of current models are prototype implementations, and it's hard to actually do this efficiently to get the kind of performance you'd expect. And then the other thing is just like, uh, well, virtual environments. So VR is like a killer right. app for sound. Like you can interact and have this sort of in your face kind of experience where objects, you know, move and make sound and, you know, you can see them obviously. And, and you want to be able to have synchronized sound there because it's, it needs to be hyper real and uh, right. it should be able to, you know, take an object and throw it in the water and have this thing happen. And you'll be able to do that in the future. It's, it's, I think a no brainer. Um, and I'm really excited about water sound right now, actually, you know, we're in California and so you can go to the beach and, you know, splash around in the water and hear waves coming in and crashing. So how do you make that huge, larger than life sound, you know, for, you know, you could do small things, the like babbling brook and, you know, you know, Cascadilla Creek, but then you can go to the ocean and hear these waves just splashing around. So how do you actually, you know, do that, right? We don't right. know how to compute the sound of water around us. Like we don't know how to actually make simulations that sound like reality. So like, just like, you know, 
you know, in, 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 in painterly rendering, of course, people, uh, you know, rendering, at least if you pick up a paintbrush, how do you make something that looks realistic? And when you can do things realistically, then you can abstract and make other things. But we still don't know how to do realistic depiction of, of, of ordinary sounds around us. So I think it's a really exciting time for sound synthesis. And it sounds like that there might be, so a lot of people are aware of this tool Dolly, where you can type in some text and it gives you the picture. What you're describing to me made me think, oh, maybe there'll be a Dolly for sound someday where I can say, you know, pounding waves with a little brook and, and all of a sudden I get a sound file that is, is, is actually uh, doing that. And so it sounds like that's where we're headed. No, I hope not. I mean, I think... <laughs> I think, well, you'll be able to do that, right? You'll be able to take data and AI will be able to turn it into some other thing. And the question is whether or not it's what you wanted or not. But what I want is I want synchronized stuff for right. interactive events. I want to right. be able to automatically compute reality in, in a computer with some geometric deformations, all the stuff. I want to have like a virtual physical environment that I interactively, interactively control. And I want to have the sound generated like that. You've got one right. millisecond to generate this thing. I'm not going to wait for your GPU to generate some junk that I don't want later. I want to have it now and I want to be synchronized, right? right? So that's, that's the kind of hyper reality that I think is a, is a goal that, that, you know, algorithms can, can generate when they're, you know, doing real time physics. So. Thanks to Doug James. That was the future of computer generated sounds. You have been listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. You can follow me on Twitter at RB Altman, and you can follow Stanford Engineering at Stanford ENG.